That's the question. I'll, I'll, I'll answer briefly. I, I have been uh, speaking about the religious aspect of this war for the last 20 years already. But when I spoke, I was told that I was a fascist, a warmonger, what have you. And now everybody acknowledges it. Uh, you see. So for me, it's not new. It's not new. Uh, already then, when I wrote the first book, it was published 15 years ago about the Islamic movement in Israel, I wrote it exactly in this context. In my introduction there, I said that since the conflict between Israel and the Arab world is no longer a, a, a national conflict. Because in a national conflict, you have two uh, political entities who fight for something that is measurable. For example, territory, asset. That's what nations fight about. And, and then when they finish fighting, they can get around the table, discuss it, negotiate. What is negotiation? Negotiation is the, a, a give and take process in which you give and take, you come to a compromise, and after the compromise, you come to an agreement, meeting of minds, an agreement. That agreement is called a contract on the individual basis or a treaty between nations. And that's how wars are fought and settlements are settled. However, when you have a religious war, that I said 20 years ago, when you have a religious conflict, a religious conflict is not about quantities, it's not about uh, assets or territory, it's about qualities, it's about values, things that are not negotiable. Because, for example, w when this moderate Sheikh <coughs> Darwish said uh, uh, then, 20 years ago, when, when he started the whole movement, that the entire land of Israel, uh, Palestine as they call it, is a land of waqf. Waqf is a religious endowment. That is a religious value. And therefore he said <coughs> it's not negotiable. And therefore very, I think, decently from their point of view, very honorably, they said there is nothing to talk about. And therefore we refuse to negotiate what is there to, to negotiate. Because if it is a waqf land, that means it is given to us by Allah to all generations to come. It is not given to us to negotiate <coughs> away. And uh, if we cannot negotiate away, that means that we cannot come to a compromise. If we cannot compromise, then why negotiate? That's a waste of your time and ours. And in that regard, the Hamas <coughs> remain exactly honest as they were before in saying the same today. Just uh, our people don't understand that. They say, we don't want to negotiate. There is nothing because we want it all. And some people still dream that, yes, in this way or that way, we'll, we'll, we'll extract some kind of negotiation from them. So that is the issue. And therefore, uh, what Zawahir is, uh, says today is perhaps the, the culmination of the same process which, which started then. And the best proof of that, look who is the, the worst enemy of Israel today in the Middle East. Iran, right? Iran is an Arab country. <coughs> Did it ever belong to the Arab-Israeli conflict? Do we have any uh, conflict or border common with Iran? We are separated by two uh, countries, Jordan and Iraq. And nevertheless, they are the most vicious, the most virulent, the most aggressive, the most threatening enemy of Israel. That means what? That it's not an Arab-Israeli conflict, that it's an Islamic-Israeli or Islamic-Jewish conflict or Islamic-Western conflict. Because when Iran, or when Ahmadinejad says what he says, he does not say it because of Arab nationalistic idea. He's not an Arab. On the contrary, Iran is opposed to the Arab. He's saying it out of Islamic motives or Islamic motivation. And that's what some people in this country don't want to understand. That unfortunately, that is the reality. In, in a month, you have my book about uh, Islam in Europe uh, coming out, and it's exactly the same issue. Because the Muslims are telling them so and so, and uh, these Europeans are saying, oh yes, multi multicultural society, and all kinds of illusions of that sort. Now they are trying to backpedal, but it's a little bit too late. Well, but that's another issue. Frida, please.
I, I don't know if you'll want to deal with this, so if you don't want to, then you won't. Frida, how can I say I don't want to? Come on. Maybe you, don't, you don't know what I'm going to ask. Maybe I'm a fascist like you, or maybe I lived in an Arab village, as you well know, yeah. for 16 or 17 years. I was the only Jew there. I went there out of very good motivations to reach out, to build bridges, to show that Jews are quite nice, you can live with us. And I came out very, very badly burnt. Well, and I have never had any doubt as to what you have just so eloquently put. And I personally am petrified of the Israeli Arab community in Israel because they talk about the Judaization of Israel. These people are aiming for the Islamization of the entire Israel. Tell me about there the is world. a plan, a project, an idea. It's somewhere hovering in the background, and it's my dream of salvation. Why are all these damn triangle villages in Israel? Because of a decision by Ben Gurion when the ceasefire lines were created, that the ceasefire lines were bad and indefensible, so straighten the line, he said, and we straightened the line and we ended up with the triangle and Umar Fahim. What if we redraw the borders? Mm -hmm. Nobody moves, not a dog, not a cat, not a blade of grass, they all stay in their homes, the only thing that moves is the border, and they wake up tomorrow morning and they're living in their dreamed of Palestinian homeland. Mm -hmm. And that way we solve their problem, they get their Palestinian identity, they can help the Palestinians with their skills and their talents, and we get the triangle out of Israel. Well, I, I te no, I'll tell you, look, first of all, the, the story, how we got that border is, is slightly different uh, from the way you <coughs> described it, because you see the Iraqis during the War of Independence occupied that zone, and that was the only main road connecting between the plain, or the coastal plain, and the Galilee. Uh, Wadi Ara, you know, it was then. Mm -hmm. And, and the, the, the strategic purpose of Ben Gurion and the military commanders of the time was A, to get the Iraqis out. And we could not get them out unless we negotiated with Jordan, because we, we ne never negotiated armistice with Iraqis. The Iraqis left and, and left the authority to deal with that uh, thorny issue with the Jordanians. And therefore, the, the, the idea was cooked between the two parties. Now, if we did not agree to that, we would have had to give up uh, the, the, the Wadi Ara Road and so on, which, was, which would have made the country even narrower than today. But now, think about, uh, about uh, what you proposed here. What would you do with the Galilee, Western Galilee, which is even more crucial today, because in, in, in the Galilee today, which is north of the Triangle, already 52% of population are Arab. Then what? Then what would you give up in order to achieve what? And I think that it's very dangerous to raise that, that precedent, because if you do it one, not only that, I, I have been involved in all kinds of conferences regarding Kosovo today. Uh, the, the question of Kosovo, and one of the issues why Israel should oppose the president of Kosovo is that you would see any minority population which, um, uh, which uh, migrates into an area and becomes a, ma a majority of it. I, in 10 years you will see that with Muslims in Malmö, wh where, where Mikhail is uh, coming from. Because today, already in that city, the 25% of the population, which is the third city in Sweden, are Muslims. And they are rising rapidly, and there are areas of Malmö where, where the Swedish police doesn't dare to enter already. And, and therefore, so what we can then, according to that precedent, they will declare, well, we want uh, uh, Malmö, uh, or the Malmö area to become, or Skåne, the, the whole neighborhood, to become a Muslim state, exactly like the, the, the Kosovars who, who came from Albania, and they became. And therefore, we should be opposed to that kind of precedent. And, and they said, even if we could resolve, according to the silly uh, proposal of Lieberman, uh, that uh, question of the border and so on, we should be opposed to it because it will be a precedent for the Galilee, which is insoluble from <laughs> our point of view. And therefore, I I am suggesting other what, other schemes. What would you do with Omar Farah? Well, I tell you, uh, to my, from my point of view, the whole question of the citizenship in Israel, the law of citizenship, the law of nationality, uh, should be altered in Israel. 
that becomes an Israeli citizen, not everybody who was born here or any Ole Hadash who came here, becomes a citizen of Israel only the person who renders a, a, a set of services to the state, which includes a service in the military and so on and so forth, <coughs> who studies in a, an Israeli school in Hebrew. Uh, so uh, we gave them the, their independent system of uh, lecturing, or of uh, teaching, and of course they teach all kinds of things that we don't want, but that is the result. Uh, it, it, someday we should, uh, we should have a discussion. Uh, I have another book about the Arabs of Israel, uh, uh, friends or foes, and this whole discussion of the education is raised there. And you see what kind of damage it does to us. And then, if somebody is raised uh, in the same school system uh, as, as my children, and uh, goes to the same army, and shares the, the fate of the country, and, the, uh, and on Independence Day does not go to lament his Nakba, then there is a, a common ground for the same state with, the, with the various citizens. What about, but, Jews? What about the religious Jews? Pardon? What about the, the religious same, Jews? But the they same, don't do any of that. For me, Haredi, Haredi and the Arabs, I, I lumped them together exactly in the same, because if we did it for Arabs, the whole world will be against us, racists. But we say anybody who does not render those services to the state uh, shares the same, the same faith, then they can be residents in this country, both of them. Residents, but not citizens. <coughs> and therefore, they can uh, live wherever they want. Nobody can expel them, but they will not be citizens of the state. I don't give them the tools to overtake me by democratic means. That's exactly the point. And the Haridim, I, I, will, I will not be sorry if they cannot decide the budget of the country, why they, they, don't, they don't contribute anything to the welfare of the country. So in that regard, I see the similarity. Well, but that's another issue I, I don't want to do. To <laughs> Howard? Um, I was, Rector, thank you very much. I was intrigued by your description of the trial in Haifa. Yeah. And um, the very fact that, um, as you put it, justice was not done, particularly the role of our current erstwhile controller, yes. and the difference between his seemingly lack of courage in that instance, yeah. and what seems to be his courage in taking on Israeli politicians and such as controller. So, uh, how do you read that? Why is that? The, uh, the other question... Well, because here there are no Arabs who threaten him. There, there were threaten him physically? Concrete. He was afraid of them. No, uh, that's, uh, that's pretty... Uh, sad. Yeah, you know, it's pretty sad and pretty shallow. That's he was the petrified reason. exactly like Frida. Uh, <laughs> no, I wasn't petrified. I was disgusted. Big <laughs> much. You used the word petrified. Stayed on my own for 17 years. All right. that, I mean, it says something terrible about our justice system, if that's the case. That's true. And... and, and it, my, my related question yes. has to do with, um, a, as you put it, the, your description of who's in the Knesset and our unwillingness, our unwillingness to either outlaw a party or to not to trial, try people for treason for acts that they have performed. I don't understand that in, the, in, in light of... Um, uh, particularly our willingness, I mean, I understand it, I guess, in the court of, of public opinion worldwide, but we're willing to outlaw a Kach party. I'm not saying that I favor Kach, but as you said, you put the two side by side. If we're willing to outlaw a Jewish party, why aren't we willing to outlaw such an Islamic fundamentalist party? Wait a minute, you are asking me, if I were the Prime Minister, I would, I would do what you suggest, but uh, I'm not. And, uh, for better or for worse. Is it only the court of public opinion worldwide? Uh, no, I don't know. Every First of all, uh, every political party in this country uh, uh, relies to a larger or smaller extent on Arab votes. Remember, Barack came to power in 1999 after he got a promise by Arab parties uh, that you would vote for him, and indeed, uh, uh, I think some 80% of the Arabs who voted for Zionist parties, 
because the big party, part of them voted for Arab party, voted for him because he made promises. And in my uh, one of my previous books about Nazareth and so on, I, I got the documents of the deal. And Arab, for example, the Communist Party, uh, it was called Khadash then, right. demanded from Barak as a condition to vote for him that he should cancel the uh, the uh, uh, military service, compulsory military service for the Druze. So that is that is more than treason, because not only don't they contribute anything to the to the security, but they want to to wreck the security or, or part of that the security that we get from the Druze community, which is which is uh, quite loyal to the state of Israel. So that kind of thing. So a general, a former chief of staff, can make a deal of that sort with an Arab party. You know, so I, I don't, I don't want, I don't want to say what it is uh, to me. So this is, this is the problem. Can so you agree every to that? Yes, Barack agreed to it. Well, no, it, no. This is a demand. That, uh, what yeah, he, sure what thing. he told them orally. Nothing that he told them in writing. I, I don't have it anyway. I don't know. Uh, they kept it a secret, but the fact that they demanded that, and that was w w that's in writing, it, it appears in the book, the whole letter of their demands, uh, it's there. And therefore, there are uh, Israeli leaders who still are counting, partly at least, on votes from the Arab uh, from the Arab uh, sec uh, the Arab sector, and that's the reason why they won't burn their bridges if they depend on, on uh, so many thousands of votes in order to be elected in. <coughs> and let me uh, uh, perhaps uh, end this uh, response by little generalization. You see, in liberal democracies, and I think we are still one of them, the leaders act like firemen. They extinguish fires to satisfy their audiences and their constituencies. They do not care what will happen 20 years hence, because they won't be around. Saddam Hussein could make, could make promises for 20 years, because he knew he would be around. And so Assad and all the other. The other. And this is the tragedy. I don't know tragedy. That's the price we pay for democracy. Every democratic leader knows that he has to run again in four years, and that he's not sure at all that he will be re-elected. So he will do anything possible to be voted in now. He makes all the promises necessary, <coughs> but he will be gone next time. And therefore, no long-term planning of any sort, including this. No, so, and that's the reason you'll be stunned now to learn that in all 60 years of the State of Israel that we are celebrating now, not once was there a governmental meeting devoted to the problem of the Arabs in Israel. Not once, because that is a taboo, nothing that is brought up. Because if they do, they lose the, the support of the Arab for next election around and so on and so forth. So they carry it from term to the next term and hoping to survive until then, what will happen in 20 years? Well, it will be somebody else to take care of it. Th this is the problem. Thank you. Final question, and then we have to move on to the movie. <coughs> uh, yes. Uh, I have a different sense of you than you do in relation to the Israeli public's awareness of this. Yes. I think there's yeah. an increasing awareness of the, of the total disloyalty of the Arab minority in Israel. And that's reflected in the increasing support for Lieberman's suggestion. That's just a remark. Okay. I have a lot of questions for you. I really... Uh, if the uh, German allows, I don't... Uh, oh, okay. On the general situation of the Arabs in Israel, first of all, what about the crime statistics? I have a sense that the Israeli... What is the crime? crime the statistics. personal crime. No, I, I did the research on this. I can give you... Okay. An <laughs> the other question in relation to payment of taxes and creation to land theft. All of these, as you say, Israeli politicians are afraid of this issue. 
Uh, the only ones who will talk about it are those who consider on the extreme right. Mm -hmm. Even Netanyahu is afraid of speaking about this issue because he's immediately called a racist, the Haaretz turns against him, everything like and this. And he's ignorant of the data, too. You can yes. add that to the list. Um, <laughs> would you say something more also well, uh, uh, about the role of the politicians, the failure to confront the no, issue? All this, all this came, came up during the or. The Or Commission. Mm. I, I was invited as an, an odd witness uh, to to the commission, and uh, and for three hours or more, I gave my uh, my opinion of this. Thing. And the question that came out that came up was, yeah, but isn't it evident? So they told me the judge that the Arabs in Israel are systematically discriminated against. They took that as an enemy. So I, I told the Arab, the Arab judge who was a member of the commission, I told him, Mr. Judge, if you say that somebody is discriminated against, you have also to set the criteria of discrimination. You know, here everybody would tell you that he is discriminated against, right? El Gurima out of those, and, the, and the, the taxi drivers, and the, everybody would say, oh, yes, we are discriminated against. So you have to set some kind of objective criteria by which to judge what is discrimination. So if all Arabs are poor and not doing well, and on the other side all the Jews are rich and doing very well, say, oh, this is discrimination. If you are an Arab, it costs you. But I said, Mr. Judge, I have done more years of study than you, right? And my salary is probably half or less than half what you get. So who is discriminated against? <laughs> I or you? That means that if you are an Arab who makes it to become a judge, then you are treated like a judge. And therefore you make more money than me. So tell me what is the criterion. And I brought up the question of, uh, of taxation. They don't pay taxes. They just do very uh, loyally. Once a year, their demonstration here near the Prime Minister's office that they don't have enough budget to finish the, the budget year. And therefore, they want more allocation because we are discriminated against. So I told the judge, look, it is true that Herzliya is richer than Nazareth. But Nazareth is richer than Bnei Brak. How come? So that means that if you know how to manage a city, or if you have industry in your city, or if you, if you have a certain kind of population or occupations in your city, you can do well, whether you are Arab or you are Jew. There are many Arab villages which, in which the inhabitants will have the beautiful houses. I wish I had a house like that. There are Arabs, and I am a Jew. So who is discriminated again? I, I, I go, I send my children for three years service. You don't. So who is discriminated against? I or you? So I say, I say, Mr. Judge, when you, you, you throw that kind of word uh, of discrimination, it has to be responsible. It has to be based on data. Uh, for example, I said, uh, the Arabs in Israel are a, a segment of the population which is uh, less productive, they don't contribute much to the wealth of the country, in, in high tech and all the things that, uh, science and so on, their contribution is very little. In crime, I did research on the crime, the rate of crime in the Arab sector is double their proportion in the population. Double, and there are statistics, and I can give you an article, an article that was ba based on statistics of the police. Uh, uh, two years before Oslo and two years after to make the, the comparison between them. And therefore, when you speak about discrimination, you, you have to prove first that you give to the state more than you get. And here it's exactly the reverse. They are first in line for Bituach Leumi, national insurance, and they, uh, so, and they get more funds from the state than they contribute to either uh, that taxation or all the rest. And therefore, I say, if you are discriminated, yes, but in, in your favor, in your favor. 
because you get more than what you give to the state. No. Uh, but of course, all, all the other witnesses who came before me and after me say that in nonsense. Of course, it's evidence that it's evident that the Arabs are dissuaded again, and they repeated the, the same, you know, the same complaints that you hear every day. So there is some, there must be a shift in this country. The things are twisted. The minds are twisted, and you have to put the things straight and uh, and uh, to fight for them. I, in, at the end of May, there will be a book launch, of my, my book about the Israeli Arabs, but, and the book launch will be done in the Knesset. It's by members of the Knesset who took the initiative, and they want to invite the public, the media, and members of the Knesset to, wake, to make people aware of the situation of the Arab minority in Israel, and so on and so forth. But, but now I, I'm, I'm finished, and I'm going to watch like you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Can I take the Thank you. 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 Thank